Uh, thank you. Basically, my name is Arda, and I'm from uh, KTH. So, background about this presentation. First, background of me. I'm a postdoc at KTH uh, with School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the Division of Decision and Control Systems. And my expertise is on uh, asynchronous algorithms for distributed optimization problems. So, uh, why I prepared this presentation, as Harold said, Bjorn gifted uh, books at Stockholm CPP 19, I think. It was back then in January. I selected this one. And back then he said, well, there will be, no string, uh, there will be strings attached. So you're going to review the book. So, okay. So there were like two books. And I picked this one. And you see there, it's Ivan Cukic, maybe. I don't know. Uh, apologies in advance if I'm mispronouncing his surname. It's functional programming in C++. So I just wanted to learn about functional programming and learn about C++ features that basically enable uh, functional programming concepts. Anyway, the, the book is there and the, the ISPN and everything is there. Uh, so it's, Harold told me that I should be preparing a presentation roughly for about 10 minutes. It might be a bit more extended because I wanted to squeeze everything. It's not, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to have some functional programming concepts from the book and then the C++ construct so that it will be a nice introduction for non-functional programming people or functional programming people that has entered uh, C++. This is what the book is for. So uh, the book is in two parts, basically. The first part um, starts with some introduction to functional programming and then introduces some concepts. So these, like the contents are all from the book uh, for Batem. Uh, broadly speaking, functional programming is a style of programming in which the main programming building blocks are functions as opposed to objects and procedures. And C++ is a multi-paradigm programming language and with the recent features introduced in C++ 11, 14 and 17, it now supports functional programming, as the book says. And then, uh, basically, the example it covers is a summing is sum, summation of a list of numbers. So in the imperative world, you you create a loop uh, explicitly, and then you just start from the zeroth index, and then count all the elements, and then uh, iterate over the elements, and then sum using a, a value, like adding it to the accumulator variable. And in the functional world. You just define what the sum is without explaining explicitly how to do it. As in, for instance, the sum of a list of numbers equals the first element of the list added to the sum of the rest. And uh, the sentinel is the sum of uh, an empty list is zero, basically. Uh, so according to the book, some benefits of functional programming are roughly in three categories. So code brevity and readability. Uh, basically, it results in shorter and more concise code. Loops and branching uh, can be replaced by higher level functional programming constructs. I'll just come to that one as I proceed, uh, as I yeah, uh, go over the contents. And then concurrency and synchronization are easier in functional programming world because usually functional programming world uh, deals with pure functions, so no side effects uh, or uh, these constructs allow for fewer shared mutable state. So mu if you have mutable state, you, you shouldn't share them. And then functional programming uh, allows for fewer shared mutable structs and, and hence more scalable parallel programs. And then uh, it allows for continuous optimization as in, I mean, you tend to use more higher level constructs such as, for instance, some STL or other li libraries and then in the end, you just rely on uh, these compiler people or standard library people uh, and they are doing optimizations on these primitives, higher level primitives uh, that you use. So compare manual implementation of some versus to reduce. If you're going to use parallel execution, then uh, with the execution support in C++, it's uh, easier and way more optimized using, you know, to use to reduce than manually doing your uh, operation, like some operation in this sense. Uh, so then it, 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 the book introduces higher order functions. So functions that take other functions as arguments uh, or return uh, functions are 
uh, returning functions are higher order functions. So some examples uh, that we might be familiar with are the transform, accumulate, partition, and so on, because they, they, they accept some sort of callable object as, as predicate or uh, as comparison functions. And then uh, it talks about some function objects in C++, meaning uh, what we can use in these uh, higher order functions as functions or return as functions. Like it can be function pointers or lambda starting from 11. Automatic return type deduction uh, is helpful for building higher order functions because now we have auto starting from C++14. Operator overloading uh, is used for functors in C++ software development. I will come to that functors uh, topic later on. In functional programming, it, it means totally some, something totally diff different. Uh, so function templates for generic function objects and then operator function objects in STL and other libraries. And then set function if you, you're going to store some functions. And then uh, advantages of higher order function is uh, you, ha you, you have different behavior for different function inputs. Uh, because when, once you supply a function of your choice, uh, you solve your own problem. So th these are generic enough, for, generic enough for solving different problems. And the disadvantages uh, using these books examples uh, are as follows. I mean, uh, the, the, the problems that the book introduces uh, heavily uses iterator-based uh, higher-order functions from STL, but they result in uh, temporaries that are not used. So if you want to iterate a, a collection of items and do some uh, modifications or views on it, as in the range, uh, li ranges library, then you create, because the, the, the STL algorithms are iterator-based, you need to create temporary collections that, that are then destructed, so you lose efficiency. And the remedy is ranges over iterators, and then it talks about ranges later on. I'll come to that one. And then uh, it introduces partial function application and currying from functional world. Uh, basically, these are used for transforming existing, existing anary functions to binary or unary ones. Uh, there is a subtle difference. So partial function application, uh, both create new functions by binding a few arguments to specific values while leaving the other arguments unbound, but in partial function application you can choose which arguments to bound or not bind or not bind, whereas in currying it's like in a, in a strict, strict ordering. First argument has to be bound and then the second argument and so on until you reach the, the, the end. And then um, in these chapters it, it says maybe the obvious for most of you you should prefer lambdas over std bind because it's generally harder to optimize std bind due to the heavy templating behind. And then, you know, lambdas is just now part of the core language. It's not some, some library function. And then uh, it talks about immutable data. So the whole th story about functional programming is you, you, you should have pure functions. So you shouldn't have uh, mutable data. And then in chapter five and chapter eight, it talks about these immutable data. And then uh, it explains what purity is, what pure functions are, and then um, to, to, to have purity, either you create copies, which will be inefficient for big objects, then it, it, uh, the book also considers using const member functions uh, with, mutable mem uh, with classes that have mutable members. And then they, uh, it suggests passing around const references because they can also uh, bind to temporary variables, basically. So, yeah. Does it talk anything about persistent data structures? Uh, pardon? Yes, I will come to that one in the next slide. I think you're talking about tree and immutable linked lists. At least these are the two ones that it, it talks about. Yeah. And then, sorry, it's here. Uh, so functional data structures, it talks about two different structures, which is immutable linked lists and bitmapped vector tree. And it basically the book explains how to build them uh, from scratch. It's really nice. So I really liked, uh, I really enjoyed reading the book and learning from it. And then it uh, also elaborates on the, the complexities of these structures when it comes to, let's say, if it's the, if it's the linked list, immutable linked list, what's the complexity uh, or is it efficient to add and remove, add to and remove from the start or end 
or a midsection. And if it's the vector tree, for instance, vector tree is just the immutable version of std vector, for instance. Uh, what are the time complexities for appending, prepending, and then uh, look, look up and concatenate, concatenating and so on. So yeah, these chapters deal with these. And then uh, lazy evaluation and ranges, finally, uh, as part of the functional programming constructs. So it talks about memoization, which is basically storing a computation and then uh, cache or forgetfully cache its uh, computations, this computation's result and then use it whenever it's needed. And then there are some constructs in C++ such as, or these are the standard template library uh, members, std once flag and std call once are relevant objects in C++ that enable this memoization basically. And then it talks about lazy sorting, item views, pruning, recursion by uh, trees by caching and so on and dynamic programming. So there are a lot of examples there. Uh, I think that's the best part about this, this book. And then uh, it talks about ranges, so views, which are um, iterators basically or constructs uh, for having read-only access and then actions that mutate uh, through ranges. And then it talks about delimited and infinite ranges. The best part about ranges as opposed to iterators is basically you can have single pass over collection of uh, items uh, when you compose these functions or uh, ranges basically so no temporaries in that sense that's nice and the part two goes uh, a bit more advanced and then introduces first algebraic types and algebraic types are used for decomposing the domain of your program and then to basically prune invalid states or basically minimize the, the number of states of a program can be in. And then it talks about product of types. So for C++ developers, it's a no-brainer. It's basically std pair, std tuple, or any traditional class that you might think of. Uh, but sum of types, uh, if you're talking about sum of types of A and B, it should either have A or B. And then it talks about different ways of achieving these. And one of them is the, the, the naive approach is the inheritance mechanism. And then it talks about unions, std variant and std optional introduced in uh, C++ 17 to, to, to achieve these things. And then uh, the author shows how to do exception handling uh, and propagating via some types, std optional and std variant and then wrapper types around those. And then uh, how to handle these algebraic, algebraic, algebraic types with pattern matching using either visit or some third party library. In this case, it's Max7. I wasn't aware of that one. And then uh, it introduces two concepts from the functional programming world, functors and monads. Now it's the functional programming world's functors. A class template F is a functor if it has a transform function defined on it. And that transform function should take an instance uh, f of that specific functor type and the function t that maps t1 to t2 and it returns a value of type f of t2. So basically all the generic collections from the STL and ranges are functors. And it basically uh, powers these func functors with a bit more uh, functionality and uh, this resulting uh, beast is the monad. A monad is a functor that has an additional function defined on it, a function that removes one level of nesting, which is this join function, which takes a, a monad of a monad of a type and returns a monad of a type. So it just basically flattens the monad. Uh, these are important if you have a problem to solve uh, which includes nested wrapper structures, such as, for instance, std vector and std optional and when you're composing functions that return wrapper types. Because, for instance, if you're working on std optional, so you have an optional value, uh, or, yes, optional value, or an exception if that optional value cannot be retrieved. And you want to uh, work on these optional values. So if you have a function, or, or if you have two functions, and if you compose these two functions, and uh, they return also wrapped, uh, types like as in std optional, all of a sudden you have std optional of std optional of some type. So this nesting structure is not good and this is also 
uh, this is something that one experiences in the future. So if you have a future value that you want to operate on, uh, and if you use this then statement uh, in for in in stead feature, then all of a sudden you have stead features of stead features of stead features and so on. So, getting rid of these nested structures and have only what you want, uh, the, the 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 functional programming world has this uh, solution or remedy which is called a monad. And then range or monad comprehensions are also uh, explained in these uh, chapters. Then, of course, it talks about template metaprogramming, uh, manipulating types at compile time using decal types, the decal val, and type traits, static assert, and template specialization, and checking type properties at compile time using CFNA, and then void t uh, introduced in C17 and const expref. So, basically, canceling out these branching uh, that are de usually deferred in run to, to runtime. But now, uh, using const expert, this branching is uh, avoided and then pushed to compile time. And then, uh, basically, template metaprogramming is really helpful for making curried functions. So it revisits these curried functions uh, in this template metaprogramming and then uh, calling all other callables, basically using std invoke and std apply. These are all useful because once you would like to create a domain-specific language using template metaprogramming, you uh, most often need curried functions uh, and dummy structures. And these also, or some of them also come from uh, functional programming, functional programming world. And the last two, tap, th th the last two chapters are basically uh, putting together all these concepts and advanced constructs of uh, functional programming world in chapter 12, for instance, for functional design for concurrent systems. It basically introduces this actor model and then actor frameworks in C++ and uh, it works on an example of a web server and client. So basically clients talk to server and uh, basically the author models react reactive streams uh, as monads. So you have streams, you, you define your transform and join functions on these streams to make them monads and then you use ranges and these monads to filter out and uh, handle errors in reactive streams, basically. And then it delves into a bit of t testing and debugging using functional programming constructs. This is a rather short chapter, but um, the, the, the short story here is basically pure, if you have pure functions from the functional world, these are uh, good candidates for unit tests. And then you can do automated generation of test cases uh, using monads and other constructs in the functional programming world. In conclusion, uh, it was a well-written and easy-to-follow book and it provides both intuition first and then sufficient theory and functional programming concepts and constructs. So this is really good for beginners such as me uh, of functional programming world. It covers C++ constructs uh, starting from 11, 14 and 17 in a neat way to help uh, implement these F, uh, fun FP constructs, basically, and concepts. This is also good for functional programming people who are new to C++. And it has uh, a lot of examples and code excerpts and then pointers to third-party libraries. And that's it from my side. I hope uh, it's interesting. And if you have some problems that could be solved using these constructs, uh, it's a nice book to have a look at, I think. I don't know if it was a good review, but yes, sorry. That's a quick question. Did you learn anything that you could apply to your own work? Yes, because I was working on, uh, well, I am still working on distributed optimization algorithms, and I, I need to use some distributed solvers, and I think this actor modeling uh, is really useful, and that's something I don't know about, uh, because I don't come from CS background. And of course, Views and actions are definitely something I should go for because in my research, for instance, I have decision vectors. So it's like a machine learning algorithm, for instance, and then different algor algorithms do different um, modifications to the decision vector. And as it is right now, I need to iterate through the decision vector a couple of times. But if I can implement these uh, ranges 
uh, or I can wrap these std vector, for instance, with proper functions to make them monads and then use ranges, it will be more efficient, of course. Like then I will have a single pass of the decision vector with all the functions I would like to have appended. So I have found some nice uh, things for my own uh, problem, basically. Any other question? Okay. Thank you. Thanks.